Hello, San Antonio. Hello. So, a as Lisa said, I'm Dr. Michael Garrett. I'm a family doctor in Austin, Texas. I have a direct primary care practice, a family medicine practice. I've uh, been doing that for about six years now after doing emergency room. I'm going to go into just a little bit about my background before we go into the talk, which will be about reversing metabolic disease with lifestyle. Um, I, I, did, I did my residency training, as she said, and finished that in 2000. And during my residency training, I could see, I didn't yet see what was wrong with the medical establishment's views on diet and nutrition and how those things impact our health. But I could see that the system already was, was broken in certain ways that I, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't see six patients an hour or four patients an hour or 30 patients a day like was being projected as, as the plan. So I ended up starting moonlighting in emergency rooms and accidentally backed into that as a, as a full-time job for about 14 or 15 years. And then I figured out a way to, um, to do primary care and have enough time for each patient with the current kind of practice that I've got right now where I basically have people do a mon monthly membership fee um, in exchange for the unlimited office visits and no co-pays and we just kind of take the third party's insurance and all that out of it. Um, and what that's allowed me to do is, is have the time to give primary care, you know, family medicine in a way that allows time for me with the patient to hear their story, understand what's going on, make the appropriate diagnosis and, and then, you know, prescribe the proper treatment and then talk about you know, what that is and what it entails and pros and cons of different options. Uh, and it also puts an onus on me then, I have that time then to really make sure that I'm doing, you know, what's, what's optimal. So, um, so I've d developed over the last few years the idea that uh, it, what's optimal is not necessarily what I was, what I was trained in. So we're gonna go through kind of how my, my thinking's evolved a little bit on that. But um, why am I here? Well, I'm here because, um, Let's see if I can get this. Because, you know, Americans are sick and fat, or fat and sick. We're, we have epidemics, as prior speakers indicated, of obesity and diabetes and prediabetes um, and, and a lot of other problems that when I was in, excuse me, <clears throat> when I was in training, um, we were sort of taught were just each of these individual kind of separate diagnoses, totally kind of distinct and, and unrelated. And I was talking to Dr. Westman uh, earlier about this. For instance, with high blood pressure, we were trained basically, well, 10% um, or so of high blood pressure is from there, there being a problem, say, with blood flow to the kidney or some other secondary cause, and 90% of it is what's called essential hypertension, which basically means we don't know why it happens, but it just happens. Just, just have to live with that. Uh, and what I've you know, come to see over time is that a large amount of that high blood pressure is actually insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia, high levels of insulin largely driven by carbs. And that's the same kind of things that are driving obesity and diabetes. And actually the cholesterol problems, a lot of the cholesterol problems we see with high triglycerides or low HDL, the types of cholesterol problems that we you know, I actually care about um, are actually driven by insulin resistance, disease, you know, lifestyle. And I started to see connections over time with all these things, with heart disease and stroke and dementia and cancer and fatty liver disease and polycystic ovary and erectile dysfunction. And there's a, a bunch of others that were listed that Allie Miller had in her talk and that Dr. Westman had. Um, all of which I, I see insulin resistance or high insulin levels or hyperinsulinemia as being not necessarily the only cause, but a fundamental root cause or connected and related to all of those. And so um, if, if we don't address that underlying root cause, we're not gonna, deal, we're not gonna be able to solve the, the problems, all these problems. We can give you a medicine for every one of these things, or three or four, uh, but we can't solve them. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of, uh, this is kind of a depressing progression from 1994, 95. This is obesity on the left, diabetes on the right, 96, 97, you can see at the bottom the, the rates or the percentages, the prevalence of these two things. What this is showing us is we have what we, we all know, I think, but a total epidemic of obesity and diabetes kind of developing together over the last 40, 50 years. It's gonna go a little bit further. So that's still getting worse. 
um, we're, we're up to, in a lot of the states there, 9% for diabetes. This is diagnosed diabetes. Obesity, greater than 26% in most of the states now in 2015. Um, so we've got a, we've got a disaster that I, I, I want to impress upon you, like this is bad news. However, the good news is, and I tell people this in the clinic every day, the good news is we have a solution for it, um, but I have more bad news. It's not a pill that I prescribe you. It's, it's actually something that you have to do, you have to consider, uh, and I think you guys are all well, well aware of this as an option, but um, sometimes people want an easy fix or, a, or the medical establishment have given them the idea that we're just gonna give you a medicine to fix this. Um, but unfortunately, medicine's not, the, not addressing the root cause. That's just a timestamp, I'm gonna skip that, okay. So this is just a little bit more data on diabetes. These numbers are from 2015, and this is based on fasting glucose or A1C. So this is, you know, looking at the US population and for people that they had data on and then surveyed, 30.3 million at that time were diagnosed with diabetes, which is 9.4% of the population, and another 7.2%, 2 million, excuse me, somewhere two to 3% of the population were undiagnosed, but when they look at the blood work, they had a, a diagnostic test, an A1C above 6.5, uh, which is that average blood sugar test, or a fasting glucose above 126. And, and this is really, even though it looks horrible, it's, it's actually kind of optimistic because the actual numbers, we've known for a long time that if we do a two hour oral glucose tolerance test where we give you 75 grams of glucose and then watch what happens with your sugar over two hours, that's a more sensitive way to find out how's your insulin response. Um, so it's worse than it looks, even there. And then pre-diabetes, which is developing before diabetes for years, we, we now know. Uh, again, these are 2015 data, 34% of the American population, 84 million adults, and of people over 65, it's 48% of the population qualified as pre-diabetic based on their, their lab tests. And again, this underestimates the problem, there's no doubt, because a two-hour glucose tolerance test detects more, and a two-hour glucose tolerance test with insulin levels at the beginning when you're fasting and over time detects even more. And for anybody that, that doubts that or wants to read more about it, this is a book by Dr. Joseph Kraft, who was a pathologist in Chicago and studied uh, pre-diabetes insulin resistance for decades doing uh, the t glucose tolerance tests and, and also insulin assays. It's now called the Kraft test for short, where you get 75 grams of glucose, you check your insulin and glucose at first, drink 75 grams of glucose, and check those tests over at least two hours. Uh, he actually did it over five hours. He did this on about 15,000 patients and was finding out in the 70s through the 90s that there's this huge problem with the tests are not detecting, detecting this problem of high insulin and, and prediabetes for years. And that pathology, he calls this the diabetes epidemic in you, that, that pathology is the same pathology as diabetes. The medical world has sort of wrongly, in my view, fixated on the glucose as the problem, the glucose and the blood sugar. And we do see that when people become diabetic. But the problem's going on for a long time before the glucose gets abnormal. The insulin levels are high and the response of the tissues to insulin is not normal for years before the glucose level goes, goes abnormal. And it can lead to all these other pathologies, even in people who haven't developed diabetes yet. So these are the kind of responses that Dr. Kraft saw. This is insulin and over time. You see five hours there and insulin level spiking up. And number five is people that are type one diabetic. They just essentially have no insulin response. So we're gonna disregard those for the purposes of our talk. That, that's a different issue, but type one is normal. And then two, three, and four are just varying degrees of hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance. That's that also called metabolic syndrome. We're gonna talk about multiple names for it and kind of what all that it can affect. So these are all different terms that have been used over time and that you might hear sometimes for this same type of pathology. Insulin resistance, who's heard of insulin resistance? Who's been diagnosed as insulin resistant? Okay, Who, who's heard of hyperinsulinemia? And who's been told that they were hyperinsulinemic? Um, there was an interesting thing from one of the other slides in my note that I missed back there, but uh, there was a huge number in that pre-diabetic group that was 84 million 
when they actually looked at the blood tests and then they surveyed these people and asked if they'd been diagnosed as pre-diabetic, 12% of those 84 million had been told that they were pre-diabetic. 88% of the people with pre-diabetes in the United States in 2015 either didn't know or had not been diagnosed as pre-diabetic, even though their blood tests clearly showed that it'd be pre-diabetic. So this is a massive problem. So I showed the list earlier of a bunch of these diseases and there are others, but of how we were kind of taught about it, how I learned about it in medical school and residency. And, and this is my slide that I made up, so forgive the busyness of the slide, but uh, this is how I'm starting to see it now is there's each of these individual diseases, some of which overlap with each other, and I didn't put those in a specific location where heart disease overlaps with stroke necessarily on purpose, but the idea is that this process in the middle, high insulin, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, is involved in all of these things. And if you're treating any of these other problems without addressing that, you're not going to be getting at the fundamental issue. So what's driving that? So we're, we have an epidemic of obesity, of prediabetes, diabetes, and what's driving that? And as you know, um, previous speakers, including Dr. Westman, have indicated, I think, it's, I think it's largely diet. There are multiple things, but I say what we eat, sugar, in particular fructose, and I made that red because it's special, it's, it's different, glucose, carbs in general. Uh, I blame low-fat diet guidelines, and I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but the food pyramid, which we were given uh, in the 70s, I blame for that. Uh, low fat, in my mind, immediately translates to high carb because you have carbs, protein, and fat. Nurse Cindy's gonna talk about the macros some more, but uh, when you remove fat, it gets replaced with something, and it's not just full of protein, it's, it's carbs, and that's what's being put in there, often sugar. Uh, I think vegetables and sugars and processed grains, they, they kind of combine this to make these hyperpalatable foods that combine sugar and fat, and that, that can be really addictive. Sugar is addictive, I, I agree with Dr. Westman about that, and we have to address that as well, often. And so what we eat is a huge part of this. Uh, I also think when we eat is a big part of it, too. If we think about traditional human societies, or if we think about human history evolutionarily, you know, we've been in similar genetic form hundreds of thousands of years, and it's, you know, now we eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, we have snacks throughout the day, we, we graze, and in prehistoric times, we didn't have 24-7 access to food. We didn't have pantries that were stocked and refrigerators and 24-7 convenience stores and grocery stores and availability of fresh fruit year-round. So we, we're in a different, a totally different food environment than, than what our bodies evolved in. Uh, I think stress is huge, and I do think that plays a role. And sometimes when I'm seeing people have trouble with dealing with some of these issues with, uh, with diet, stress is a common problem. Uh, it increases cortisol levels, increases glucose or blood sugar, and increases insulin levels. And as I said, I think a huge part of what we're dealing with is, um, is hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance, and I use those interchangeably. They're kind of different, different uh, angles on the same process. I think sleep is, is a common problem as well, either not enough or poor quality. And again, if we're missing our sleep, we're going to have increased cortisol levels stress, our hunger hormones go up. Uh, so that's a common contributor as well. So I talk about diet and lifestyle and that's gonna be the focus today, but those, those other issues need to be used to troubleshoot sometimes too. I put activity on here and I'm not convinced uh, whether that's a cause or effect. I mean, there's definitely some evidence that, you know, the metabolic stuff happens first and then you don't want to do the activity or you don't want to exercise. I do think sometimes uh, muscle and strength training, resistance training can be used to help reverse some of this as well for sure, um, but I don't think it's a primary cause. So I'm going to go back to the causes for a minute. Sugar, I, I wanted to put this on a slide. I found 61 and I think Nurse Cindy's even got more, um, but I couldn't put it on a slide because they didn't all fit and she's got a bigger one, but there's 61 <laughs> names. And so I want to give you three slides on this. Again, I highlight fructose because it's special. Um, high fructose corn syrup. I mean, there's tons of these and you ought to be looking at nutrition labels if you're reading things that have nutrition labels. It's great to eat things that are just food and don't have a nutrition label. But if you do, you need to know what all these are and watch out for them. A couple of slides I have to do about sugar. Um, added sugar is in 74% of packaged foods. And that includes things that are being made to be low fat. So this is added sugar. It's not just that packaged foods have carbs or sugar, but they're adding sugar to 74%. That's a huge number. And another related slide is that the average American eats 66 pounds of added sugar 
a year. And if we think about insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, those high insulin levels, the primary driver of that, in my opinion, is, is sugar.